Good morning to you all. Uh, you know, as a trade union leader in the past, I feel I'm not getting a really good deal from, from game. Because last night they made me sing for my supper, and today they make me sing for my breakfast. And the breakfast, well, didn't exactly meet the standards. <laughs> but uh, just listening to the conversation this morning, I felt you know, the need to just give you a little story about uh, the time in which I sat as a minister in Nelson Mandela's cabinet in the first few weeks. And remember, we had just stepped back from the precipice of a racial catastrophe. And we were sitting there as very hostile protagonists in the cabinet room. And uh, I, as a leader of the trade union movement, had been on a number of death lists, uh, including that of, uh, of state-driven uh, covert operations, and then, for those that understand South Africa and know it, of the Inkata Freedom Party. And here I was sitting next to president, the former president, the last president of apartheid South Africa, President de Klerk, and next to Butelezi who was the leader of the Encarta Freedom Party. And uh, someone asked me the question, how can you sit next to people who wanted to kill you and who killed or were responsible for the deaths of many of your closest comrades? And uh, you know, my answer was very simple because uh, it's a simple answer that Mandela often gave that uh, you did not negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your enemies. And, and for me, it, it really was about how does one uh, learn from the past, better understand your present, in order to deliver a better future. And so we sat around that table on, a better, on the basis of principles, of objectives, of building a non-racial, democratic, non-sexist South Africa. That was the future we committed to. So when I listen to the debate today as to who should be here, who not be here, I, I'm sort of struck by that metaphor because in a sense, what are we here for? Are we not here to build a better future for the generations that come after us? To solve the, the human indictment on all of us that one child dies every six seconds of preventable causes. And so my preference, and it's, you know, I feel it's sometimes an academic question, is that we need an open tent, actually. And we need everyone in the room so that we can have these robust conversations between ourselves of what are the right things to do and how do we take the steps together to solve the crisis that we all face. The second thing that I feel that uh, we need to reflect on it's wonderful to have 33 countries committing to do something. But you know, one thing that I do understand from business is the need for focus. So where are you going to do something? What are the resources required to do? What are the commitments a country has to give before you do it? And some of these are tough questions. Can you start a global campaign in 33 countries? Let's be realistic about this. Or are there going to be some countries that have to take the step forward? And how do you come to a consensus as to who those countries are? So I think that you know, paper is a wonderful thing. It uh, accepts anything that is written on it. I think the real taste of the pudding is going to be in the eating. Who's going to do it? Where's it going to be done? And where's the first evidence that we are making progress beyond having conferences like this? So I think that you know, it's, it's really wonderful to be here and to try and build the chassis of a new vehicle that we want to drive in to tackle the problems that face us. And I reflect on this and think about the last 50 years or 60 years since the end of the Second World War. The commitments on ending malnutrition, on hunger, and in development span that period. Have we asked ourselves the question why we have failed? And who has failed? 
Have we held people to account in terms of them having failed to deliver? And whether it's 870 million people or 1.2 billion people, it still is an indictment on all of us. And we have to ask ourselves the very critical questions of what have we done wrong? And how are we going to change how we do things? The world has changed a lot from that time because at that time it was dominated by our governments who made political commitments to solve many of the challenges of development that we have in the world today. But what's happened since then is that the emergence of a range of new players, non-state players, whether that's business, whether those are foundations, whether that's civil society, social movements. And so we have a very different environment, an ecosystem in which to work. And it requires new thinking. It requires new partnerships. It requires innovation. It requires a focus rather than institutions on solutions. And I think that's the challenge that we face today. And I'm, I'm very glad because today uh, we are going to hear from Minister Costello, because Ireland, I think, has a remarkable history. You know, it was almost feudal at the time of the emergence of the European Union. How did it drive its progress? You know, how do we understand the great famine that drove this massive migration of Irish people out of, out of Ireland? You know, I have a vested interest in it, Minister, given my wife is uh, a, an immigrant that left her ancestors left Ireland. But I think that Ireland, in a sense, demonstrates a deep commitment to social justice, to human dignity. And the commitment that you made when I was present at the launch of the Thousand Day Campaign is an indication of that. The fact that you are going to take over the EU presidency and the G8 prevents us, presents us with a unique opportunity to craft something different in terms of how we can put nutrition and food security decisively on the agenda of the world. So I think 2012 really begins to demonstrate some of the deep malaise around the issue of food and nutrition security. That was evident at the time of the Great Famine. What we are seeing is increasing and growing hunger, poverty, and inequality. As I travel around villages and informal ghettos, I see the deep despair, the desperation. And people are giving up hope in global institutions, in multilateral processes. They're giving up hope in that their leaders will do something different to change their lives. Trust has broken down. And whether you go to the World Economic Forum in terms of their, their surveys, or whether you do the, look at the independent surveys, I can say quite clearly and categorically that vast swathes of the global population today have lost faith in our ability to lead them to a better place. And what we have to do is demonstrate and rebuild that confidence in people. And we are only going to be able to do that if we really tackle the issues that are closest to their heart. When I travel to places in the north of Kenya, I see the desperation of climate, the climate crisis, the drying up of the lakes, the, the, the eradication of the grazing lands that people lived off, the fish that are dying in those lakes. And we look at these people and, and we treat them as statistics. And so I, am, I look at Africa and I've come recently out of a conference with 400 African youth leaders. The average age of half the population of Africa is under 20. The average age of a head of state is over 60, but closer to 70. There is such a phenomenal disconnect there. By 2035, the workforce in Africa will be bigger than that of China. By 2050, one quarter of the youth of the world will be African. What is the future that they believe they have today? When in fact, half of them 
that go through, even where they have the benefit of education, end up with very few skills, no jobs, and unlikely to have the dignity of, of labor in their lifetimes. And this is a phenomenon not just in the developing world. You come to Europe and you're seeing increasingly the same phenomenon. And I think that is the, the challenge that we face. And I think in that challenge, we have to look at very fundamentally different ways of solving these crises. I look at the issue of land grabs in Africa. 60% of the arable land left in the world is in Africa. I visited Mozambique recently. Six million hectares of land have been given away to large companies and foreign governments. They have displaced communities. They are destroying biodiversity by pursuing monocropping. They are increasing household food insecurity. So here's a great opportunity that we have as Africa to not just feed the world, but to feed ourselves. And what's happening? Growing food insecurity. And if you look at some of these statistics that are coming, for example, that I've read, if you look at malnutrition, then 80% of the problem of mal malnutrition are the children of people who are smallholder farmers and marginal farmers. Are we looking in the right place when we want to target malnutrition? We know conclusively that if we increase the rights, the incomes, and the empowerment of women who are farmers, who produce 80% of the food in Africa and Asia, that we know that there's empirical evidence that the health, education, and nutrition of their children improve. What are we prepared to do to take a stand on that? Where women in Africa own 2% of the land and, ex and, and access 10% of the extension services. So these are the structural issues that we have to tackle and have the courage to tackle if we want to solve the issues of malnutrition on a systemic basis. Otherwise, we are putting on a bit of elastoplast. And we may walk out of places like this and conferences like this with feeling very good. But the reality is that those hungry will grow in numbers and they will remain hidden from the sight of those that are in power. So part of the challenge that we face here today is talking truth to power whether that power is economic power of you as businesses, whether it is the United Nations, whether it is the elephant in our room, which is our governments, or whether it is civil society, which often acts like a poverty elite representing the poor, but whose views often don't coincide with the views that I hear at the coalface. So I'm hoping that in the Sun movement and have a sort of approach of humility that movements don't come from rooms like this. Movements come when people take ownership at a grassroots level in those ghettos, in those villages. When they take ownership of their future, like I saw when I had this meeting with the Dalit movements, they are the ones that will take the fight for better nutrition forward. And we should see in them our true partners. And so I'm hoping that in, in, in the way we conduct ourselves, that we will have the courage to stand up and stand for the truth, to admit where we have wrong, to correct that, to learn from our past mistakes in order that we can deliver a better future to the children and the future generations that come after us. Because there's a saying that I often use, that we do not inherit the world from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I want to thank the World Food Programme and I want to thank the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition as conveners of the Sun Business Network today for inviting me here this morning uh, to give a keynote address. <coughs> and indeed, a bit like Jay, I had to sing for my supper last night and I'm going to have to sing for my lunch today as well. But uh, I think Jay took it a step too far when he refer referred to Ireland being feudal at the time we joined the European <laughs> Union. 
So steady on, Jay. We <laughs> I don't know what that wife of yours has been telling you, but uh, <laughs> but there is a certain slight truth in in uh, the remark. At the time we joined the European Union in 1973, which is just 40 years ago, roughly at, the, at this point. Um, we were a very poor country. We were a totally rural country, 75% of our product, and 75% of our product went to the United Kingdom. Uh, now we're very much an urban country, 75%, 40 years, and 20% of our product goes to the United Kingdom, and the rest is dispersed around the world. Less than 50% uh, average of European GDP, uh, Ireland, 40-something, 48%. We are now in excess of 100%, even in the middle of the worst economic crisis that we have ever experienced. So it certainly is all very relative. But how did it happen? It happened very largely because of the transfer of resources from the European Union through structural cohesion social funds that came to Ireland <clears throat> that were invested in our people, in our education, and which gave us that launching pad that changed us very, in a single generation from a rural country, agricultural country, it's still very important, it's agribusiness now of course, uh, to a country that is a high-tech country uh, and a major exporter, approximately 85 to 90 percent of everything we produce is exported. So in many ways what we're talking about here in terms of um, developing countries, transfer of resources, uh, assisting with um, development at various levels is not 100 miles uh, removed from the experience that we had less than half a century ago. <clears throat> Can I say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that um, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak on the nutrition of the global development agenda and to try and deal with it insofar as possible in the context of our experiences both in the past and going forward. So I do believe that this year we have seen the scaling up nutrition movement come of age. And I think it was David Navarro mentioned there earlier uh, yesterday that 2013 is the year that nutrition comes to life. I think that was a good line and I, I believe that. 2013 should be the year of nutrition. It now enjoys a clear and robust governance structure and a clear sense of purpose and strategy. There is considerable global governance uh, and consensus around the need for multi-sectoral approaches and for strategies to be developed and driven at country level. And I think we all saw how in recent months uh, quite a number of big hitters have come on the stage. We have seen the fact that Hillary Clinton last year um, became a real champion of nutrition and scaling up nutrition. Uh, how David Cameron in August at the Olympic hunger event again became a champion of scaling up nutrition. And every time you speak to the Commissioner for Development, Commissioner Peabags, he is more and more enthusiastic about the need to put nutrition at the heart of the Commission's strategy and the European Union strategy. So the movement is nothing without the energy and dynamism at the same time of its lead group and its six networks. The network of a country focal point is the central, country focal points is the central cog, supported by the work of the business network, civil society network, United Nations work network and donor network. And I'm delighted to be here today for the launch of the business network for the Sun Movement. Tackling hunger and undernutrition is a cornerstone of Ireland's development programme. 20% of our Irish aid budget is dedicated to addressing hunger uh, and as Irish Minister for Trade and Development, harnessing the potential of business communities at home and abroad to improve nutrition is something that is very close to my heart and the portfolio that I have in terms of trade and development allows me to, uh, to, to work in that area. I would like to focus on two areas this morning. Firstly, I will outline our plans for our forthcoming presidency of the European Union, 
particularly in relation to opportunities for Ireland to champion undernutrition. And secondly, I will outline how we in Ireland are working with businesses to achieve our development outcomes and how we view the role of business in addressing undernutrition and malnutrition. Firstly, our presidency in the first six months of 2013 comes at a critical time in international development as we approach the deadline for achieving the Millennium Development Goals in 2015 <clears throat> and look to shaping the post-2015 agenda. For the term of our presidency, we have identified three priority themes. The three are closely interlinked and all will benefit from a strong engagement uh, with and from the community, the business community. The first will involve developing a coherent EU position on the international development agenda post-2015. Ireland will continue to advocate that the objective of poverty or education should be central to all our efforts. And of course, ever since we passed the uh, Treaty of Lisbon in 2009, the elimination of poverty is now a treaty requirement for all 27 member states. In recognition of the continuing hunger crisis, food and nutrition security, uh, poverty eradication will be included as an important indicator of wider human progress. A number of consultations, as you all know, have been launched to feed into this process, and I would encourage you to engage with the thematic consultation on food security and nutrition in particular. Secondly, <coughs> we are seeking to address the linkages between hunger, nutrition and climate change. Ireland will host an international conference in Dublin on the 15th and 16th of April 2013, jointly with the Mary Robinson Foundation with the World Food Programme, we're here today naturally, and the International Committee on Agriculture. The aim of this conference is to encourage dialogue between those impacted by undernutrition and climate change and key policymakers and opinion formers, including the important private sector voice. The frontline experience of farmers in developing countries, local practitioners and representatives of the most vulnerable households and communities will be central to this conference. It will, in many ways, be what we would call a bottoms-up conference with those who have uh, <clears throat> been the recipients of the MDGs and the SDGs in the past uh, able to have a voice as to what went right and what went wrong. We would encourage the business network to consider climate change and nutrition links in your deliberations in order to promote sustainable uh, solutions to global hunger. <coughs> Thirdly, we will work towards a consensus on how the EU can improve the resilience of vulnerable communities to natural and man-made crises, such as the current food crisis in Africa. We need to systematically address the risks that lead to crises and erode hard-won development gains. Encouraging greater coherence between our relief and development efforts is key to this challenge. Nutrition challenges and opportunities span both emergency and development contexts, and countries experiencing fragility are in particular need of the multi-stakeholder partnerships which the Sun Movement embodies. So I would encourage you to consider the role of businesses in situations of fragility and to ensure that risk assessments are systematically integrated into your investments and partnerships. My portfolio in Ireland covers development and trade promotion. My department published an Africa strategy in 2011. The strategy calls for a broader engagement with Africa, one that builds on our development cooperation work and which includes deeper political relations and the promotion of mutually beneficial trade and investment, both between the country as country to country, civil society to civil society, and the aid programme to the various partnership countries. Irish aid has engaged with the private sector over the past 20 years. While we have had some mixed experiences, we have also had some notable successes, which could provide some learning for the Sun Business Network. <coughs> in the field of global health, for example, we have partnered with a number of health product development partnerships and with the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance on Vaccines Initiative, and the Global Fund for the Delivery of the New Drugs and Vaccines. Diseases primarily affecting developing countries 
have historically been neglected by researchers and drug companies in the West. This was a result of the high research and development costs and inability to pay amounts to affected populations. This led to distrust between developing countries and the major Western pharmaceutical companies driven by profit motives. However, years of collaboration and negotiation based on sound principles have brought us to where we are today, <clears throat> delivering more vaccines and life-saving drugs to the people that desperately need them than we could have dreamt of 10 years ago. And that, in many ways, is a lesson for how we approach the nutrition issue. One lesson learned from our work in HIV and the health sector was the need for clear rules of engagement to safely manage public-private partnerships. And Mark referred to that as one of the challenges and one of the elephants in the room, as Jay mentioned. The Sun Business Network is ideally placed to address some of the current gaps in stewardship of the technological aspects of improving nutrition. Sadly, however, nutrition is an area in which the role of private sector has been poorly perceived by many. This has led to a sometimes toxic relationship between some civil society groups and the private sector. It is the responsibility of us all to counter this and to build trust through constructive and ethical engagement. And that is the expression I would like to use, ethical engagement. That will offer a more complete picture of the role of business in addressing malnutrition. A number of useful tools have been developed to facilitate this process, such as the 2011 United Nations Framework on Business and Human Rights, which sets out responsibilities of states and companies to protect human rights wherever they operate and engage. Both local private businesses in some countries and businesses based in Ireland and other donor countries have an important role to play in addressing nutrition challenges. In Nigeria last month, I visited the Nutrisima plant in Lagos, which is 50% owned by a major Irish food company, Glanbia. Nutrisima is taking Irish dairy ingredients and developing a variety of products which are modified and adopted for Nigerian markets. These products do not require refrigeration and they are sold across the country in literally thousands of outlets. So they are coming right down at every level with a high proportion reaching young children and mothers in isolated urban, area, um, urban and rural areas. <clears throat> In Malawi, I visited a factory producing local ready-to-use feeding products to international standards. The factory was supported by an Irish social enterprise combining research and development from Ireland with local producers. From individual smallholder farmers in local markets to private schools and health centres, multinational corporations and investment portfolio managers, the private sector is a very broad church indeed. All of these can contribute in their own way to addressing nutrition challenges. Some work in regions characterized by tight regulation and significant subsidies, while others are exposed to the full force of local and global markets. An area on which the Sun Business Network could usefully focus is on communicating to the public and to Sun stakeholders the range of businesses in the network and their common identity, their principles, and their sense of purpose. The emphasis of the Sun Business Network is rightly on building an efficient virtual platform which will help business to engage while ensuring that activities support Sun priorities and ethical standards, and doing this with a minimum of bureaucracy. While activities stemming from corporate social responsibility are welcome, indeed very welcome, and can indeed be very valuable, what we are really talking about today is leveraging the core business of the private sector to improve global nutrition while ensuring long-term returns for sustainability. And that is really our challenge. I met with political leaders in both Ghana and Nigeria last month. They were concerned that in their urban areas, people cannot produce their own food and will need to purchase affordable, nutritious food. This demand allows for local farmers distributors and retailers to grow while also providing opportunities for some of the international businesses in the room today. Providing access for the poor to the right food they need 
at the right place, at the right price, is the responsibility of us all, and again, is the key challenge. I know that some Irish companies, especially dairy companies, are ready to apply some of their best research and development capacity to help meet the nutritional needs of developing countries and to respond to country priorities. And likewise, our state agencies and our departments are involved in that respect. In addition to scientists and researchers, we have finance, supply chain, marketing, quality assurance, biotechnology, and communication expertise. Others specialize in energy and natural resource management, and I hope we can explore today concrete examples of businesses that have oriented their core business to addressing the nutritional needs of poor countries in an ethical and sustainable manner. The challenge that arises at local level is that much of the food consumed in mini markets is neither branded nor is it traceable. There is thus little or no quality control. Working together, businesses, consumer groups and government can promote appropriate regulation to improve the quality and affordability of products. In my recent travels, I have often noted an assumption that nutritious food products will be mixed with safe drinking water to address stunting and wasting. Unfortunately, of course, this is not the case in many of the communities I visited. If water is contaminated, there will be no benefit from investing in more, in more nutritious food. I'm aware <coughs> of one Irish company that is working at the moment, uh, Medintech in Wexford in the south of the country, on some trials of adding micronutrients to water purification tablets, which could transform a lot of the, the water overnight. Sanitation, hygiene and drinking water provision are areas where public-private partnerships have had some success and are a critical complement to direct nutrition, nutritious interve nutrition interventions. So, as a business network, you have enormous potential to scale up proven nutrition interventions in a sustainable manner. You are central to every step in the food and health value chains at local and global levels. So there are a number of challenges ahead, some of which I've outlined, but I'm very confident that we can work together effectively uh, to tackle the, the hunger and chronic malnutrition. Indeed, if we do not work together, uh, we will certainly fail. Uh, we do need both the donor sector, the civil society sector, and we need, above all, we need the private sector. And just in relation to that challenge that was put to us by Mark, uh, how do we work in business, how does the business sector engage with developing countries in a manner in which credibility uh, can be established, and perhaps in some cases restored. <coughs> I think it is a real challenge because the perception abroad in developing, many developing countries, the perception abroad in civil society, very many civil society, is that the private sector is only interested in profit and indeed, in many cases, exploitation. I think that's, that's something that has to be changed, um, and it's not going to be easy in many ways. There is that suspicion uh, abroad, and certainly go the length and breadth of Africa. There is a perception that there is a new scramble for Africa afoot, led by the private sector and by the multinational sector. And it's going to be difficult to deal with that. What we do in Ireland, uh, is that we engage with all our private companies. We tell our private companies that we work with them as a government, our state agencies, the various expertise that we have at the public sector. We make that available to them. We make available to them the environment uh, that we have built up, if you like, over the decades and centuries in a, con in a continent like Africa that our missionaries have provided a strong reputation abroad for our country, that Irish aid has built on that in the succeeding years, and that we don't want them, under any circumstances, to tarnish that reputation. And that is what I would describe as the first step and the first principle towards ethical engagement by our private companies. So can I say in conclusion, that we intend to ensure that the issue of nutrition is foremost on the agenda 
during our, pre our presidency in the European Union, hunger, nutrition, the eradication of poverty. That furthermore, we are very interested in ensuring that as the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs are developed, discussed, that those issues remain at the core of the new objectives moving forward. So, once again, thank you for the invitation to address you this morning and all the best in the rest of the deliberations today.